In this video, I'm going to be discussing the physics behind photon depth dose distributions, including a discussion of the buildup effect and an explanation of how and why they change when we alter things like field size, source to surface distance, and angle of beam incidence. I mentioned during the last video that percentage depth dose curves are generally measured using a scanning water fountain. They are obtained by moving a detector up and down and measuring dose while the beam is on. This allows us to determine how dose varies with depth in water, which we class as equivalent to patient soft tissue. We call them percentage depth dose curves because they're normally normalized. We do this by choosing one point on the curve, normally the depth of maximum dose, or dmax as we call it, and dividing the dose at every depth by this dose and multiplying it by 100. This gives the dose at dmax a value of 100%, and the dose at every other point is expressed as a percentage of this dose. For example here, 1.6 gray is 80% of 2 gray, so this becomes 80%, and 0.2 gray is 10% of 2 gray, so this becomes 10%. This is why it's called a percentage depth dose curve. The shape of a percentage depth dose or PDD curve depends heavily on the beam energy. Low energy beams in the kilovoltage range tend to deposit a high dose near the surface, which falls off very rapidly with depth, as we see here with the 120 kVp beam that I've used as an example. But as beam energy increases into the megavoltage range, the dose at the surface drops, and we see a depth of maximum dose emerging beneath the surface, which gets steadily deeper with beam energy, and we also see that dose falls off less rapidly with depth at higher beam energies with the slowest falloff being seen for the 18 MV beam here. We're going to talk about three key features of these curves. The first one is surface dose. So the KV beam deposits its maximum dose right near the skin surface, whereas a cobalt-60 beam, which is quite a low megavoltage energy beam, only deposits about 30% of its dose at the surface. 6 MV beams deposit about 15%, and 18 MV beams deposit about 10% of their dose at the surface. The majority of surface dose in these high beam energies is due to electron contamination from the treatment head, which I discussed in the previous video. The depth of maximum dose, or dmax, tends to increase with beam energy. We tend to class KV beams as having a dmax of zero, depositing maximum dose at the skin's surface. This isn't entirely true, as there is a small build-up region in low energy beams too, it's just that it's very very small and we don't generally see it on measurements. I'm going to go into why on the next slide. A cobalt-60 beam has a depth of maximum dose of around half a centimeter, 6MV about 1.5 centimeters, and 18MV about 3.3 centimeters, although there is some normal variation in these values. The amount of dose delivered at depth also varies with beam energy, which is one of the main reasons why we're interested in treating with higher energy beams. At a depth of 10 centimeters, a depth at which we could reasonably expect to find a treatment target, a 120 kVp beam only delivers about 21% of its maximum dose. Cobalt-60 delivers about 55%, 6MV about 67%, and 18MV about 80%. So if we're interested in treating deep structures whilst delivering a lower dose to structures lying above, a higher energy beam is a good idea since if we're treating a target at about 10 cm depth and trying to avoid something at about 3 cm depth, a higher ratio of dose delivered at 10 cm depth compared with that delivered at 2 cm depth means that we can deliver proportionally less dose to the more superficial structure. When looking at megavoltage beam PDDs, we see an obvious increase in dose just beneath the surface. This is known as a build-up region. There are a couple of different ways that we can explain this build-up effect. The first involves recognizing the fact that a photon beam turns every irradiated point within a medium into a radiation source, with its own little dose distribution around it. The dose received by a point is mostly due to the dose produced by surrounding points. The dose is received from points that are below, beside, but mostly from above. It's only irradiated parts of the medium that act as radiation sources. Close to the surface, there's no medium above these points in the build-up region, so these points are not receiving dose from irradiated points above. This results in a lower dose. If there was extra medium above points in the build-up region, then there would be extra radiation produced in this medium, which would contribute to dose at these points, so the build-up region would receive a higher dose. But the points close to the new surface would still receive a lower dose, since there's no medium above, and thus no radiation being produced in the medium above. This is a very rough way of looking at it, but it's useful to know that areas next to the edge of a patient or phantom are going to get a lower dose than if they had more directly adjacent material. Textbooks generally use a more rigorous one-dimensional explanation for the build-up effect. It's similar in that we look at each point as producing electrons, but we only look at how they travel in one direction. If we assume for the moment that each point produces roughly the same number of electrons, and keep in mind that dose is proportional to the number of electrons passing through, we see that different depths have a different number of electrons passing through. At this shallow depth we get 1, slightly deeper we get 2, slightly deeper again we get 3, and then 4 electrons passing through. Depths that have more electrons passing through get a higher dose. We see here that dose would increase with depth because there are more electrons passing through greater depths up to a point. This is the main reason why we see the build-up effect, because the number of electrons builds up at first with depth. But if we look slightly deeper, we see that the number of electrons stops increasing, 
it levels out at 4. This is essentially what happens at the falloff region. Now the reason that the PDD curve keeps decreasing rather than staying constant in this region is that the same number of electrons are not produced at each depth. Each depth will produce slightly fewer due to photon attenuation. The number of photons undergoing interactions and producing electrons will decrease with depth due to attenuation, and therefore the number of electrons produced at depth will decrease too. If we include this in our simple diagram by saying that we lose about 10% of our photons between the depths that we're looking at, it looks a bit like this. The number of electrons produced at each depth decreases by 0.1, and we see that this continues to decrease after the depth of maximum dose, which is what we see in reality. This method is also good for explaining why higher energy beam PDDs look so different from their lower energy counterparts, specifically in that the surface dose tends to be lower, depth of maximum dose tends to be deeper, and dose falloff is less rapid. When we increase the beam energy, the increase in the depth of maximum dose and part of the decrease in surface dose can be explained by an increase in electron range. Higher energy photons tend to produce electrons that have a higher energy too, so they travel further. When we look at the number of electrons passing through different depths, we see that the longer electron range means that more electron paths can overlap at a given depth. See here we get 6 appearing at one depth instead of 4, since electrons that are produced at the surface can travel further and overlap with those that produce at greater depths. The depth of maximum overlap, which is also the depth of maximum dose, is also greater in the high energy beam than for the lower energy beam, since it's approximately equal to the electron range. The effect of beam energy on surface dose is a little bit less straightforward. Surface dose tends to be lower in higher energy beams. And we see in the higher energy beam here, the ratio of electrons at the depth of maximum dose to that at the surface is 6 to 1. In the lower energy beam, it's 4 to 1. This makes sense if you know the definition of the surface dose, which is the dose at the surface divided by the maximum dose, and in a percentage depth dose curve, we're going to be multiplying this by 100. So a higher ratio of electrons passing through the depth of maximum dose to that of the surface is going to meet a lower surface dose, because the dose at the depth of maximum dose will be much higher, even if the surface dose is approximately the same. It's important to note that this is not the only effect on the surface dose. Electron contamination from the treatment head is quite important as well. And the reason that doses reduce more slowly with depth in the falloff region is that higher energy photons are attenuated at a lower rate than low energy photons. The falloff is slower because the beam is attenuated more slowly. You may be wondering why we don't see a build-up region in low energy kilovoltage beams. This is because low energy photons produce very low energy secondary electrons which have a very short range. And since the size of the build-up region varies with the range of secondary electrons, this region exists but we simply don't see it because it's very small. I've already talked about the effects of beam filtration on kilovoltage beams in my video on beam attenuation. It affects megavoltage beams as well. This is normally an effect of the flattening filter or of any wedge filters that we may place in the path of the beam. Passing through a flattening filter results in beam hardening. This is an increase in the effective energy of the beam due to preferential attenuation of low-energy photons. Passage through a flattening filter raises a beam's effective energy by about 2 MV. So flattening filter-free beams, which have recently been released for routine clinical use, will have percentage depth dose curves that are similar to those produced by a beam of slightly lower energy. A 6 MV flattening filter-free beam will produce a PDD that's similar to a 4 MV flattened beam and a 10 MV flattening filter free beam will produce a PDD that's similar to an 8 MV beam. PDD shape depends on radiation field size. And by that I mean the size of the beam. So the size of the hole that allows a beam to escape from the linear accelerator, and the amount of material inside the beam. When we increase the field size, we see three major effects. The surface dose increases, so most linacs will produce a maximum field size of about 40 by 40 centimeters. An MV beam with a 10 by 10 centimeter field will normally have a surface dose of 10 to 15%. When we increase the beam size to the maximum of 40 by 40, it rises to about 40 to 45%, and tends to be highest in large field sizes with high beam energies. The depth of maximum dose tends to move slightly towards the surface. This is if we're increasing the field size above about 5 by 5 centimeters, as the depth of maximum dose tends to be deepest at 5 by 5 centimeters, and becomes shallower if we either increase or decrease the field size. I'm going to go into why in a moment. The dose in the falloff region is also increased. The effect on the depth of maximum dose and surface dose can be explained by the effect of field size on the amount of scattered and contamination radiation leaving the treatment head. Surface dose is mostly the result of electron contamination, which I've drawn here in yellow, and dose within the first few centimeters of tissue is also heavily influenced by low energy treatment head scattered photons, which I've drawn here in light blue. The higher energy primary beam tends to contribute dose slightly deeper. Contamination electrons and scattered photons are produced all throughout the treatment head, and in particular the flattening filter. When the field size is small and the collimators are close together, most of the scattered radiation is blocked from striking the patient. When the field size is increased, more of these electrons and low-energy photons are allowed through the collimator and contribute to doses at shallower depths. 
This results in an increase in surface dose and a reduction in the depth of maximum dose. Let's have an extremely rough go at visualizing this graphically. Electron contamination, shown here in yellow, deposits those at the surface, then drops off very quickly. The low energy scattered photon component, shown here in light blue, drops off a little more slowly, and the higher energy non scattered beam component, shown here in purple, doesn't deposit much dose near the surface, but it does at greater depths. If we combine these components, we can see how electron contamination and low energy photons can drag the depth of maximum dose towards the surface. The depth of Dmax is decreased in smaller field sizes because the contribution of the higher energy primary beam is reduced under these conditions. This will make more sense after we've discussed the effect of field size on dose follow-up. We were able to explain the build-up effect in terms of each irradiated point acting as a little radiation source. In that example, we looked at the distribution of electrons around each point. In order to explain the effect of field size on dose follow-up within a beam, we look at the distribution of scattered photons emerging from each point, which have a much longer range. Each of these points contribute dose to those around them. So if we increase the size of the beam, we're increasing the number of radiated points, and we're increasing the amount of points contributing dose to their surroundings. So increasing beam size increases the dose to each point due to scattered photons. We call this phantom scatter, although in theory patient scatter would be an equally applicable term. More phantom scatter means more dose, and we tend to see more of it at greater depths in larger field sizes. This is partly due to a build-up effect of scattered radiation, more of it tends to accumulate with depth, and also due to the fact that the beam is diverging, so it tends to be wider at greater depths. To recap the effect of field size on the depth of maximum dose, it tends to be deepest in fields of around about 5 by 5 centimeters. In smaller field sizes, it becomes shallower due to decreased phantom scatter resulting in less dose deposited at depth, and in bigger field sizes, it becomes shallower due to increased collimator scatter resulting in more dose deposition at shallower depths. A 5 by 5 centimeter field produces the greatest depth of maximum dose because it's the size at which these two effects balance out. Source to surface distance, or SSD, also affects the shape of the PDD curve. When you change the depth, you're not just changing the amount of material between your detector and the source, you're also changing the distance between the detector and the source. So the beam will be losing intensity due to attenuation in the material, and also due to spreading out with increased distance from the source according to the inverse square law. Remember that the inverse square law basically means that beam intensity drops off very quickly with distance from the source at short distances, and it drops off very slowly with distance at large distances. So when far from the source, we see here that the variation of beam intensity with distance is quite flat. This means that as we increase our SSD and move farther away from the source, the drop in beam intensity inside the patient due to inverse square fall off is reduced. This is why dose at depth tends to increase as we increase the SSD. The depth of maximum dose also increases as SSD increases. This is because the intensity of treatment head scattered photons and contamination radiation decreases more rapidly with increasing SSD than that of the primary beam. This results in a lower contribution of dose at shallow depths, and the resulting increase in the depth of Dmax. This is partly why we also see a decrease in surface dose, although it's also due in part to the fact that the photon intensity at the surface and at Dmax is more similar, because there's less reduction due to inverse square fall off. So the ratio of dose at Dmax to that at the surface is also higher. The angle at which a beam strikes the surface also has an impact on the shape of the depth dose curve. So a beam that is obliquely incident upon the surface, that is, that it's not striking it directly face on, has an increased surface dose, a shallower depth of maximum dose, and a more rapid dose fall off. The increase in surface dose can be explained by looking at the behavior of electron contamination radiation. Remember that the dose to an area is proportional to the number of electrons passing through it. If a beam has a normal incidence, the electron contamination is going to travel more in the forward direction. If the beam has an oblique incidence, electron contamination is going to travel a more oblique path through a material. You'll get more electrons overlapping at shallower depth, and therefore the dose at shallower depths will be higher too. The depth of Dmax gets shallower as beam angle increases for similar reasons. Let's look instead at the secondary electrons produced by each point due to photon interactions. Secondary electrons tend to be produced more in the forward direction than up to the side or the back, so they'll travel a certain distance downstream from the beam. When you tilt the beam, these distributions are tilted too. So electrons which are produced in the direction of the beam tend to travel an oblique path too, and since they take a diagonal path, they don't make it as deep as those that are produced with a normally incident beam. This means that the electrons don't have as long a range in the depth direction when the beam is oblique as when the beam is normal. The depth of Dmax approximately corresponds to the secondary electron range within the medium, so this is why Dmax tends to be shallower. Dose falloff tends to be more rapid, because if we look down the axis along which we measure our percentage depth dose curve, we see that parts of the beam that reach points that are further down have to travel through more medium to reach that point. So they experience more attenuation than if they'd simply taken a straight up and down path with a normally incident beam. This results in a lower dose of depth and a more rapid dose falloff. 